Look, we're no strangers to failed mega projects here on this channel. Time and time again, we've seen hubris and overzealous ambition lead to towering catastrophes and money pits that are so vast they appear to have no bottom. Whether it's cost overruns, poor planning, or technical mishaps, the world is littered with great half finished monuments to mankind's misplaced ambition. But today, let's cast aside such failures and instead inject some much needed positivity into our minds by focusing on five mega projects from a single nation that aimed for the stars and actually landed among them. But where to find such consistent excellence? Well, there can be only one place, a nation that is a global powerhouse in infrastructure development, a place where audacity meets precision, where ambition pairs with meticulous planning, and where mega projects are completed with such frequency and efficiency that it has become woven into the very identity of the nation. We are, of course, speaking about China, and positively for once. The Three Gorges Dam, towering at a remarkable 594 feet and extending over 7,770 feet across the Yangtze River, is the world's largest dam and hydroelectric power station. This gargantuan monument to China's engineering might holds back the vast Three Gorges Reservoir, a sprawling artificial water body that covers over 400 square miles and stretches 370 miles upstream. Construction began back in 1994, when the first stone was laid on what would be eventually become the Great Dam. It was simply a Herculean feat, requiring the labors of over 250,000 workers, 21 million cubic yards of concrete, the most in any single structure in the entire world, and 463,000 metric tons of steel. Naturally, this took a lot of time, and the dam didn't have its ribbon cut until 2011. That's a whopping 17 years after those first stones were laid. The cost of all this? A cool 37 billion US dollars. Naturally, then, given its insane scale, the Three Gorges Dam produces a lot of electricity 540,000 megawatt hours per day, to be precise, which, for reference, is almost 10 times the amount produced by the Hoover Dam in the United States, which has a total capacity of around 50,000 megawatt hours per day. Now, you might think that nuclear energy might be able to give the Three Gorges Dam a bit of a run for its money, but no, the Kashiwazaki Kurira in Japan, one of the largest nuclear power stations on Earth has a total capacity of about 200,000 megawatt hours per day, almost a third of what the Three Gorges is capable of. As for coal, it's not even a competition. There's the Taichung Power Plant in Taiwan, one of the largest on Earth, produces a mere 132,000 megawatt hours per day. In fact, it turns out the Three Gorges is the single biggest power station on Earth bar none, accounting for just under 3% of all of China's electricity, a nation which, lest we forget, is home to over 1.4 billion people. But there is more to the dam than just generating electricity, because it also plays a vital role in flood control, being able to hold back a staggering 22 billion cubic meters of water and release it when needed, thereby controlling the flow along the Yangtze. If the water level is too high, they just hold more in the reservoir, and if it's too low, they just release some of it. The control of the water level downstream of the dam has also worked wonders for shipping along the river, because now, thanks to randomly fluctuating water levels being a thing of the past, maritime planners know exactly what width of water they're going to be dealing with and can therefore plan for significantly greater quantities of ships to navigate the river. But, well, like for any engineering project, for every upside Side, there is a downside, and the Three Gorges Dam is no exception. 1.3 million people had to be relocated during construction. But nations need energy at the end of the day, and so the Chinese government made sure to make the relocation as painless as possible, ensuring equivalent, or in many cases better, housing was secured for those who had to be moved, as well as cash compensation for the inconvenience. There was also the question of the cultural damage, because with the reservoir covering such a vast area, many archaeological sites would invariably be submerged. Again, the Chinese government accepted the unfortunate reality of the situation and did all it could to minimize the damage, deploying an army of archaeologists to strip the soon-to-be-submerged area of fines while the dam was being constructed. This was not a perfect solution, of course, and invariably things will have been missed. But at the end of the day, it was reasoned that people need power and compromises had to be made somewhere. So there you have it, Three Gorges Dam in all its glory.
Not so much a mega project, really, but a mega city. Shenzhen was just a sleepy little fishing village just a few short decades ago, and now it is one of the planet's largest and most advanced cities. The transformation is nothing short of jaw-dropping, a testament to China's big dreams and relentless pursuit of urbanization. To explain how this happened, we must go back to the late 70s, when the Chinese government decided to designate Shenzhen as the country's first special economic zone, a playground of sorts to try out economic reforms and free market policy. The goal? To bring in foreign investors, boost trade, and sling Shenzhen into a whirlwind of development that would transform it beyond recognition. Fast forward to today, and it is clear that this experiment was successful. Shenzhen's landscape is a veritable maze of enormous buildings and sprawling urbanization. Nowhere is this clearer than on the city's skyline, which is now home to 10 of the world's 100 tallest buildings. Chief among them is the Ping An International Finance Center, a 115-story towering masterpiece which is both the tallest building in Shenzhen and the fifth tallest in the entire world. This crown jewel was completed in 2017 at a cost of $1.5 billion. But Shenzhen's transformation goes further than just impressive buildings, as enormous amounts of money have also been spent to make sure that the city's infrastructure is world-leading. Nowhere is this more evident than with the city's metro system, which didn't exist at all before 2004, and now has 16 lines, 369 stations, 547 kilometers of track, and a daily ridership of over 6 million. What's more, it isn't like the tube in London where you need to sell a kidney or take out a second mortgage to fund your daily commute. The cost of a day ticket comes in to a whopping 16 cents. So earlier we alluded to Shenzhen's population exploding since the 1970s, but well, just how much has it grown by? Well, back in the mid-1970s, the population in what is now Shenzhen's metropolitan area stood at around 3,000, with around 300,000 in what is now Greater Shenzhen. Those numbers now stand at, wait for it, 14 million and 20 million respectively. Such a rapid population explosion has created a unique culture within Shenzhen, as there are really any locals as you might imagine them, as even the earliest settled family is only on its third generation in the city. The result is a unique blend of cultures from across China that you simply won't find anywhere else. Shenzhen has also become really, really rich, with a jaw-dropping GDP of over $400 billion and a GDP per capita well in excess of the Chinese standard. Largely, this is due to Shenzhen taking on the mantle of China's high-tech industry. The city is a powerhouse of innovation, teeming with research institutes, technology parks, and computing industries, with some of China's biggest tech companies being based out of Shenzhen including Huawei and Tencent, to name just two that you've probably heard of. Now, this is, of course, just a small snapshot of Shenzhen's metamorphosis from a sleepy fishing village to a buzzing megacity. There's much more to this story, but what we hope that we've made clear is that this megacity truly belongs on a list of Chinese mega projects. Few of China's mega projects inspire international envy quite like its high speed rail system. Across the globe, nations are forever aspiring to knit their cities and regions together with the speed and efficiency that only high speed rail can offer. It's the dream for a lot of places, just whisking passengers from one city to another in the blink of an eye, slashing journey times, and turning the daily commute into a breezy high speed glide. Some countries have tasted success with their attempts, many have stumbled, faltering on the steep price tag, or getting tangled in logistical knots. But then, there's China, a nation that isn't just playing the high-speed rail game, it's changing the rules, setting the records, and leaving everybody else in the dust. It all began in 2008, when China, aware that its rail network was rapidly aging and no longer up to scratch, decided to do something about that and announced a highly ambitious mass high-speed rail project. Fast forward to today, and you'll find a web of tracks spanning over 38,000 kilometers. To put that into perspective, this is a whopping two-thirds of the entire planet's high-speed rail network, all within one country, although quite a big country. If we compare this to other countries, the true shocking disparity becomes even more evident. Some admittedly do high-speed rail right. Take Japan, for example, the birthplace of the bullet train, and for many decades, the leading pioneer of high-speed rail. They just break the 3,000-kilometer threshold, a more than commendable length for a country of their size. Similarly, France fares well with just under 3,000 kilometers worth of high-speed rail. But countries like this are the exception. And many more developed nations completely fail when it comes to high-speed rail. For example, the United Kingdom, the birthplace of the train no less, has a paltry 109 kilometers of high-speed rail. And the United States, the richest nation on Earth, has a mere 80 kilometers. 
So what's the truly awe-inspiring feature of China's high-speed rail system? Well, it's the high-speed part. Take the fastest train as an example, the mighty CRH380BL. It regularly travels at 350 km per hour during passenger services and has topped out at 487 km per hour during testing. For context, the Class 800, the shiny new pride of British Rail that ferries passengers between London and Edinburgh, a more normal train, tops out at 200 km per hour, although they did once push it to 230 in testing, which is impressive, not really. These insane speeds allow China's high-speed trains to cover the country in lightning time, with a journey between Beijing and Shanghai, a distance of 1,300 km, only taking 4 hours, compared to the 12 hours that it used to take. But don't think this rail network is just about shuttling passengers. It's also a massive economic catalyst. Building and running high-speed rail lines has sparked job growth and spurred economic development across regions. It's greased the wheels of trade, made supply chains more efficient, and given regional economies a huge leg up. By accelerating the movement of goods and materials, the high-speed rail network has supercharged China's economic engine. Another feather in the cap of the high-speed rail network is its transformative impact on remote regions. Extending these speedy tendrils to outlying regions has opened the floodgates of opportunity, allowing better access to education, employment, and healthcare, truly raising living standards in previously isolated rural areas. Of course, the incredible rise of this network hasn't been without its bumps. Rapid expansion raised eyebrows over sustainability and environmental impact. But China hasn't shied away from these challenges. Energy-efficient trains, renewable energy use, and green initiatives that minimize disruption to the environment are all par for the course as China's high-speed network advances even further. It is also pretty expensive, with the bill currently estimated to be in the region of $300 billion for the current network. But given what they've achieved and the asinine tat that other governments would waste such capital on, it's hard not to see this as good value for money. And that's all lovely, of course, but there's one more aspect of China's high-speed network that it would be criminal for us not to mention, and that's maglev. This high-tech form of transportation harnesses the power of magnetic levitation, enabling trains to glide above their tracks virtually friction-free and at speeds that conventional trains, even high-speed ones, just can't match. China currently has one such line, the Shanghai Maglev, which runs 30 kilometers between Shanghai Airport and the city center. It was originally built as a passenger-taking prototype to test the technology, and it opened in 2004. But despite the incredible speeds it can achieve—431 kilometers per hour in passenger service and 501 kilometers per hour in testing—the line Line was deemed too expensive for wider use and thus sat as a curioso relic to what could have been. Or so it was until 2021 when the Chinese government announced the construction of a new maglev line between Beijing and Shanghai. The line is projected to open in 2030, and if all goes as planned, it will top out at over a thousand kilometers while traveling in vacuum sealed tunnels, and it will complete the journey in just over two hours, which is almost as fast as flying. In 2011, U.S. Congress passed the Wolf Amendment, restricting NASA's ability to cooperate with China, basically barring them from participating in the International Space Station program. But rather than seeing this as a setback, China opted to create something that no other nation on Earth currently has, its own entirely indigenously made space station. The first steps were taken in 2016, when China unveiled its grand plan, projecting a five-year timeline to launch the core module of the space station. In 2021, bang on schedule, they launched Tianhe, the 22-ton core module, serving as the control center and primary living quarters. Following this, two additional modules, Wentian and Mengtian, were added in 2022, turning Tiangyong into a multi-module space station capable of hosting various scientific experiments. The Tiangong space station orbits Earth at an altitude of about 340 to 450 kilometers, similar to the ISS. It accommodates a crew of three astronauts for 20-day missions, a duration expected to extend as the station evolves. The modules are well equipped with advanced facilities to conduct a wide range of scientific experiments. This includes research in microgravity, astronomy, space medicine, biotechnology, and even climate change, offering unprecedented opportunities for scientific breakthroughs. Inside Tiangong, each module serves a unique purpose. We already know about Tianhe, but further to this is Wentian and Mengtian, the lab modules, which come equipped with all the apparatus needed for the experiments that we just mentioned. Together, they form a complex megastructure that, despite being smaller than the ISS, is certainly a handy bit of kit. The station is also set to host its first international astronaut soon, Several countries have shown interest in joint flights to Tiangong, with candidate selection and intensive training on China's Shenzhou spaceship set to begin in the near future. 
As well as training on the operational aspects, foreign astronauts will also gain cultural knowledge, including Mandarin language skills, to better enable them to work alongside Chinese astronauts and operate the Chinese machinery. But the most interesting part of Tiangong is its future. With the ISS approaching the end of its service life, and Tiangong having a projected 10 to 15 year operational lifespan, it could soon become the only operational space station, period. Consider further the fact that China plans to conduct a manned flight to the moon by the end of the decade, and eventually replace Tiangong with a much more advanced and substantial space station, and one can't help but be excited about the future of this space program. Picture this. A project of gargantuan scale, set to tackle the water woes of a nation. That's exactly what the South North Water Transfer Project is, an engineering marvel and one of the most audacious water diversion ventures ever embarked upon. And it's got a whopping price tag of $79 billion. So what's the goal of this? Well, that's to breathe life into the arid northern territories by channeling water from the bountiful south. Born out of the stark water inequality between regions, this project couldn't have been more necessary. At the turn of the millennium, cities like Beijing and Tianjin, nestled in the northern parts of China, were predicted to soon be besieged by crippling water shortages if something wasn't done. The reason? Limited local water sources and an ever greater demand for water spurred by enormous population growth. The alarm bells rang loud and clear, and so the central government initiated the South North Water Transfer Project in 2003 while they still could. The project comprises three main routes spanning thousands of kilometers across the vast Chinese terrain. The Eastern Route, a modern adaptation of the historic Grand Canal, extends over 1,152 kilometers using pumping stations to draw and distribute water from the Yangtze River northwards. The Central Route, also known as the Grand Aqueduct, spans approximately 1,264 kilometers and harnesses the power of gravity to channel the water from the Danjiang Coal Reservoir on the Han River to Beijing, without the need for pumping stations. The the proposed western route is set to divert water from three tributaries of the Yangtze River near the Bangkala Mountain, extending across various provinces such as Qinghai, Gangzhou, Shangxi, Shangzi, Inner Mongolia, and Ningxia. Despite the formidable cost and scale, the western route's implementation is still under construction, poised to push the boundaries of hydrological engineering further. Naturally, China faces the hefty challenge of juggling environmental and human considerations while completing the project. Rerouting a river system doesn't exactly scream eco-friendly, and the potential impact on aquatic habitats and land use is a real concern. But China isn't shying away from these challenges. They faced them head on. They implemented stringent measures to reduce the ecological footprint using cutting edge technologies to monitor and safeguard delicate aquatic ecosystems. And what about the energy required for the water transfer? Well, they made sure that a significant chunk of it came from renewable sources. They also forbade the construction of any industry on the banks of the new canals in order to protect the quality of the water supply. What about the people? Like we saw with the Three Gorges Dam, it sometimes is an unfortunate reality that if a mega project is to be completed, people will have to be relocated. The Chinese government was under no delusions about the hardship that this represented, so once again they set out to make the move as painless as possible for affected residents, guaranteeing equivalent or better housing as close to the affected settlement as was practically possible. They also offered surprisingly generous cash compensation to the affected peoples. Again, it's an unfortunate yet yeah, understandable decision. At the end of the day, people need water.